Anita's back. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, I have two items for all of you at the top before we get started. Uh, as all of you have seen, the Secretary is on travel today in London uh, to consult with the United Kingdom and other counter ISIL coalition partners on our shared efforts to degrade and defeat ISIL. His schedule today included meetings with UK Foreign Secretary Hammond, French Foreign Minister Fabius, with EU Special Advisor Cathy Ashton, Iraqi Prime Minister Abadi, and with the counter ISIL coalition small group steering committee, as well as a meeting on Libya. Uh, he also had a press availability a couple of hours ago with Foreign Secretary uh, Hammond <coughs> um, and with Prime Minister Abadi. Uh, you may have also seen this yesterday, but I just wanted to bring to your attention the statement that was put out by uh, Alex Lee, our Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs. Uh, yesterday, uh, January 21st, U.S. and Cuban officials met in Havana to discuss technical issues related to the Migration Accords of 1994 and 1995 between the United States and Cuba. The Cuban delegation was chaired by Foreign Ministry's Director General for U.S. Affairs, Josefina Vidal Ferrero. Uh, Alex Lee led the delegation for the United States. Uh, the United States hosted the last round of these semi-annual talks in July 2014 in Washington. Uh, during these meetings, uh, the United States and Cuba restated their commitment under the Migration Accords to ensure that migration between the two countries remains safe, legal, and orderly. They also agreed to regularly review the implementation of these accords, continuing to ensure safe and legal migration between Cuba and the United States is consistent with our interest in promoting greater freedoms and increased respect for human rights in Cuba. The productive and collaborative nature of yesterday's discussions proves that despite the clear differences that remain between our countries, the United States and Cuba can find opportunities to advance our mutual shared interests, as well as engage in a respectful and thoughtful dialogue. In addition to discussing the bilateral implementation of the migration uh, accords, our teams also exchange ideas on other aspects of safe migration, such as the return of uh, Cuban excludable aliens, the Cuban family reunification, parole program, and the monitoring of repatriated Cuban nationals. Uh, as you've also seen, uh, Assistant Secretary Jacobson arrived in Havana yesterday. Yesterday she met with uh, the Jewish community as part of her engagement with civil society groups in Cuba. Uh, there was a working delegation with, uh, with with working dinner with delegations at the Chief of Mission residence yesterday evening. This morning, she has been meeting with the Cuban delegation to discuss the reestablishment of diplomatic relations. Uh, she'll also be having a press availability on the ground to discuss uh, that as well. With that, Matt. Right. Uh, well, I want to start somewhat further afield in Cuba, mm -hmm. and that would be uh, Yemen, mm -hmm. where the government has evaporated essentially. There's no president, there's no vice president, there's no prime minister, there is no cabinet. What's your take on the situation realizing that this is just happening now? Correct. It just happened. Uh, we've obviously seen the reports. Our team is seeking confirmation of all of the reports. Uh, we continue to support a peaceful transition. Uh, we've urged all parties and continue to urge all parties uh, to abide by um, the PNPA, the Peace and National Partnership Agreement, uh, the, GC the GCC initiative and its implementation mechanism. Uh, as I think you also saw, uh, there was a reported agreement uh, last night between the Yemeni government and the Houthis. Uh, this is a potentially positive step to de-escalate of uh, violence in Sana'a and return to established processes of dialogue. There's no question that implementation of that by the Houthis and taking specific steps, including the immediate release of the presidential chief of staff, pulling back of armed Houthi forces, uh, and steps to get Yemen, Yemen's political process back on track are key to determining the success well, of that. I understand that, but that's kind of OBE, as we would say, overtaken by events. There well, is no government. I don't think we now. look at it in that way, Matt. We're still look, seeking confirmation, uh -huh. but we're also assessing what that would mean. Right. But you were referring to an agreement that would, came out yesterday between a government that no longer exists and the rebel force that appears to have control of, uh, just appears, does have control of the capital. So I'm wondering how it is that you can continue to support a peaceful transition. I mean, a transition to what? Well, Matt, again, we don't have confirmation of it, but we haven't yet assessed. We're not going to jump to conclusions about what it means until we have a confirmation and we have time to assess, working with the Yemenis, discussing internally what it means. In terms of, well, okay, but I, I understand that you need 
the time to assess what it means, but I don't understand the lack of confirmation because it's pretty clear that it's chaos, that there is no government right now. So I, I'm not sure that when you say you continue to support a peaceful transition, are you saying that you continue to support an agreement that was reached yesterday between a government that no longer exists? Well, Matt, broadly speaking, Houthis? of course we continue to support a peaceful transition. There have been dialogue. There has uh, dialogue that we expect and hope will continue. Uh, and that's the only way, in our view, to uh, de-escalate the situation on the ground. Um, and, and in terms of the embassy, mm -hmm. what's the status of that? Well, as I noted yesterday, but it's worth repeating, of course, the safety and security of our personnel are of paramount uh, importance. We are pre prepared to adjust our presence if necessary, but there has been no change in our security posture. So there hasn't been any change. So, so basically, Anarchy is not enough to uh, to get you to adjust your presence? Well, Matt, with all due respect to your assessment as an AP reporter, we have the United oh. States government and our team on the ground okay. uh, assessing fine. what is needed. And I'm not, we take it very seriously and we'll make changes if we need Don't misunderstand. To. I'm not saying that you should or I, that I think you should. I'm just wondering what it, you know, what would it take um, because it seems pretty bad right now. Well, we've all seen uh, the... Uh, images on television, and certainly we've seen violence escalate uh, over the last several days. There was a lull in that a bit yesterday, uh, but we want to assess what's needed, and we're, we're certainly prepared right. to take steps. Last if one, we do need you know to. when the last contact was between uh, a U.S. official or State Department official mm -hmm. and the now ex president? I don't have anything on that for you. Uh, I can see if there's more we can offer. So you don't agree with the assessment that there's anarchy in Yemen then? I don't think I put it in those terms, so I'll, I'll leave it in my own terms. What would you describe the situation as then? I, I don't think I'll leave it as I just described it, uh, Joe. We're, we're obviously there's news that's been breaking. We're assessing what that means. We're looking for confirmation of that. We're continuing to uh, encourage uh, and support a peaceful transition. And obviously, uh, we're, we're not in a position, and I don't think any of you are either, to assess what it means at this point in time. But I just wondered if you had any further updates on. The investigation you said was going to take place into the uh, attack or the shooting of mm -hmm. your diplomatic vehicle at a checkpoint uh, yesterday. I don't have any updates on that at this point in time. Could I just follow go ahead. Can, yeah. Is it on Yemen? Or yeah, just yeah, so on we, Yemen. Okay, go ahead, yes, Saeed. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, you are not opposed to the principle that the Houthis can actually uh, be part of the government, correct? Well, this is a discussion. This has been a discussion happening between parties on the ground. We support that effort, uh, but we're not making a decision or assessment of that. Because although there are different factions and different political agendas, there are mainly two groups, basically, and ultimately they would have to somehow to coalesce to form a government. You would support that kind of effort. I think we have to see how this all goes. Obviously, it's in our interests mm -hmm. to have uh, a return to or a, a, a peaceful transition, and we certainly support that, as I've stated, Saeed, but I'm not going to get ahead of where we are. There's no question it's a very fluid situation on the ground. Violence has been increasing. It's something that certainly there have been ongoing discussions about internally within the administration. The United States and Yemen had very close relationship in fighting terrorism, mm -hmm. especially Al-Qaeda and in the Arabian uh, Peninsula, and that presumably will, will continue to be the case. You're Who right. are you talking to? You know, I'm sure there, and you said that there were no contacts or uh, the, the, in response to Matt's question. I didn't the say there the were contact. no contacts. I said I didn't have an update. Uh, uh, we have remained in touch, certainly on the ground. I'm not going to outline for you the specific contacts. I will say that our top priority <laughs> in Yemen remains the counterterrorism effort, mm -hmm. uh, where we've been targeting Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula for a number of years. That's ongoing. Uh, we targeted, we've been targeting AQAP uh, for some time now. Okay. And my last question is. Are you in contact with the Houthis in any way, at any level, you know, on security matters? I just don't have any more. I, I will say for you, uh, say to you, Said, and you know this already, right. that the Houthis uh, don't want to see the rise or success of Al Qaeda uh, in Yemen right. either. Right. So uh, certainly, counterterrorism uh, is an effort that is ongoing, but I don't have any assessment of that. This so point. that can be construed as common grounds between the United States and this group. Correct? I don't think I, I'm going to assess it further. They may not have an interest in seeing AQAP gain ground, but they do have an interest in, a, in basically creating a an Iranian ally. Is that not a concern? Well, I think I spoke to this a little bit yesterday. Yeah. I think we remain troubled by the right. long the history of a of a work between the Houthis and the Iranians. Now we don't assess that there is 
or don't have information on a sort of new cooperation on that right. front. Um, and, and I don't expect you to be able to answer this because mm -hmm. literally these reports are just coming in. Okay. But apparently the Yemen parliament has rejected President Hadi's resignation, no, realizing that you're not aware of this, uh, or probably not aware mm -hmm. of it since it literally just happened. Mm -hmm. um, is that the kind of thing that you would like, to, they've called for an emergency session tomorrow. Is this the kind of, would this be the kind of thing that you would encourage? I think, Matt, we ju I just have to talk to our team. I mean, they're assessing this uh, as we speak, so I just don't have any analysis at this point in time. See any more on Yemen before we continue? Okay. What kind of international role could there be for Yemen? I mean, uh, for the next sort of uh, uh, next phase now, I mean, uh, as things happen now, or what your allies, let's say, like Saudi Arabia, and people who brokered the deal to begin with, you know, for, for Yemen, the GCC, uh, what are they doing? In well, terms of as I noted, I think there are proposals and initiatives that GCC put forward one uh, that uh, have been out there, and certainly we would support the implementation of. I think there are many countries that you mentioned, and certainly the United States, who have a stake in seeing a peaceful transition. So I'm sure this is a topic that the Secretary and others will continue to discuss with his partner, uh, with his counterparts. Uh, all, uh, since some of the Gulf countries were at the mm -hmm. meeting in London, was do you know if it was any was any part of the secretary's discussions? Let me talk to the traveling team. I, I hadn't asked them that specific question, but I can see if it was raised and on the margins. I wouldn't be surprised, mm -hmm. but I'll check. Uh, see if Yemen Syria. was raised. Yemen, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of questions on Syria, but uh, before that, is there any way you can give us a perspective about the secretary Kerry's? Uh, visit to uh, Britain in, with regards to anti-ISIL coalition you just talked about. What is the current, uh, uh, what is the aim of the visit? Is there any way you can? Well, I, I would just point you, the secretary gave uh, extensive remarks and also did a press availability. So I okay. would really point you to that. He outlined the purpose, why he was there, what they accomplished and spoke about it pretty extensively. You are not asking about this, I believe, yesterday mm -hmm. that the president, uh, president's union of uh, State of Union speech and his reference to Syria. Uh, many people take it as, uh, let me ask this way, does the U.S. government still ask Assad uh, to uh, step down at this moment? I'm not sure why anyone would have a different assessment uh, from the President's State of the Union speech. We maintain our belief that Assad has lost all legitimacy and must go. Uh, there can never be a stable, inclusive Syria under his leadership. We've said that since August of 2011. Uh, just today, uh, Fred Hoff, uh, former state official, wrote a piece, and uh, he, was, uh, he was arguing that uh, the current Assad regime uh, terrorizing uh, attacks on the civilians still continue after three years mm -hmm. that we have been calling. And the Mr. Hoff's argument uh, is that uh, U.S. does not uh, give strong message to Iran and Russia to make sure that uh, they put pressure on Assad regime to stop at least attacking civilians with barrel bombs. Just happened today in Haseka, I believe, uh, killing 65 people. Uh, what would you say that? Are you putting enough pressure to Russia and Iran? Well, as you know, our discussions with the Iranians are focused on the nuclear negotiations, um, and that's our primary focus there. As it relates to Russia, the secretary, as you know, speaks with Foreign Minister Lavrov on a regular basis. Often Syria is a topic of discussion. We certainly understand that their relationship with the regime is different from our relationship with the regime. We've spoken publicly, privately, uh, countless times about our concerns about the Assad regime's uh, attacks uh, and deplorable actions against civilians. Uh, there are uh, the secretary also had recent meetings on his last trip with uh, De Mistura about his efforts and his initiatives. So we're really discussing and supporting uh, any option that could reduce the suffering in Syria. It is more than a difference. You don't have a relationship with the Assad regime. Fair right? enough. I mean, That's a more clear and, way of stating it. And are you saying, based on the answer to the first, the State of the Union question, are you saying, and then your response about Assad having mm -hmm. lost legitimacy, are you su suggesting that? Certain people may have overinterpreted what Secretary Kerry may or may not have said in Geneva with with. I think that's Envoy an accurate assessment. Yes, and I know Marie spoke about this quite a bit she did. Uh, last week. But can I just ask sure. on, on that point? Um, uh, the, the, the Russians are putting together talks mm -hmm. um, early next week in 
Moscow with the with the Syrians and some mm -hmm. of the Syrian opposition have said they won't go some have said they will go sure uh, what is your uh, feeling about these talks and what is your advice at the moment to the opposition with whom you're in touch well um, as you noted this is a Russian-led initiative with Syrians uh, at this time the United States has not been invited to participate nor have we been involved in the planning uh, I think that's we've spoken about that many times in the past uh, we welcome any effort to make progress toward addressing Syrian's core grievances and uh, anything that would produce a sustainable solution to the conflict. Time will tell whether this meeting is a forum that will make any progress on that front. Uh, on this topic of the opposition, uh, we have been in touch with the opposition. We certainly conveyed we'd support them attending the meetings, but it's, it's their decision to make. And um, you say that the United States hasn't been invited. Would you like to be invited? Do you think there's a role for the United States in such talks? I think there are a range of options, a range of talks under discussion. Uh, I don't think it's something that we are uh, angling for an invite you're to. Not, you're not sitting by the phone waiting for the call. <laughs> the, or you could say it that way. And you don't think it, but I mean, considering that the United States has had such an investment in uh, certainly in the Syrian opposition. Mm -hmm. Would it not be helpful uh, at least to have some kind of observer status? At well, we remain in close touch with the opposition. They know they can call us. We call them. We're in close touch with them. Uh, we'll see what comes out of these talks and discussions and what the next step is. Uh, you know, we've been in touch with Russia over the course of the last two years about what role we can all play in a political transition. Uh, we'll see if there's anything that comes out of this meeting. And the Assad regime uh, government has seemed to make it clear that what they want to talk about is an end to terrorism. I'm not really about an end to, a, or, or not really about a political transition away from the Assad government. Mm -hmm. So given that, do you really believe, or do you think that this could actually address what you called the Syrian's core, the Syrian opposition's core um, demands? Well, it's not just the Syrian opposition's call. You know, if you dial back to a year ago and the meeting of, I think, more than 60 countries and entities in Geneva, it was the call of the international community to have a political transition consistent with the principles of the Geneva <coughs> communique, which are, uh, you know, by mutual consent, a transition of the government in Syria. Of course, terrorism remains a concern. Obviously, ISIL is a concern that uh, many countries, including the United States, has. Uh, but that needs to be the objective of these discussions and negotiations, and that remains our view. Thank you. Jen, reconcile for us, if you can, all these statements that you make. On the one hand, you say that he lost all legitimacy, mm -hmm. knowing that uh, Assad represents a large minority in the country. There's a huge number of people that actually look to Assad as their representative. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you're saying you want a political solution. How could you reconcile these, you know, divergent? Uh, positions in essence. I frankly don't see, think they contradict sight. It's <coughs> long been our position that when you have a dictator who has right. killed tens of thousands of his people or tens of thousands of people have died on his watch, mm -hmm. uh, he no longer is the legitimate leader. I, but I, we believe that transitioning through a political process is the right way to move forward. I understand, but you know, I mean, he's not going anywhere. He's been around for a long time. This killing will continue to go on. And obviously, the best solution is really to bring all these groups together. So. Uh, wouldn't it be wise and prudent for you to encourage the opposition to go to these meetings in, in Moscow and elsewhere and perhaps to restart some sort of uh, talk, maybe Geneva 3, like you said, well, 60 countries I, I know you often like to bring up Geneva 3, and you're yeah. a fan of that. I'm, um, a fan of that. But I'm, I'm a fan of any country. I would, that I would say, Saeed, that, again, we support there are a range of discussions and mechanisms by which, which talks can happen. It's up to the opposition. We conveyed to them. We would support them attending. They'll make those decisions. Go ahead, Samir. Uh, were you able to get a U.S. reaction to the Israeli killing of the Iranian general? On, There's just the nothing Golan I'm going to add to what I said yesterday on that. But, but you condemn that same you condemn topic. Hmm? I, I want to stay on, on Israel for a sure. second. Yesterday, in his press conference, the secretary quoted an unnamed Israeli, senior Israeli intelligence official as telling a congressional delegation that new sanctions on Iran but imposing new sanctions on Iran now would be like, quote, throwing a hand grenade into the process. It, the way that he presented it, the secretary, it sounded as though whoever this senior intelligence official was, was opposed to sanctions. It now emerges that this official may have, in fact, been either supporting the sanctions because they want the uh, talks to uh, collapse and then resume, 
with more pressure on the Iranians. So I'm wondering, does the secretary believe that whoever told him about what this intelligence official said was misleading him? Well, I'm not going to speak, I'm sure doesn't surprise you, uh, to further to private discussions that happen with Israeli intelligence officials about intel assessments. Well, yeah, other, but he brought it up. Well, not me. other than to convey, it was a discussion of assessments, not policy recommendations. Uh, intelligence agencies do assessments. They don't make policy But the way that the context in which the secretary said this mm -hmm. was that even the Israelis think that it's a bad idea for, or even an Israeli intelligence official thinks that it's a bad idea to impose to, to, to impose sanctions. Well, and that let me unpack does not that seem a little bit further. Case. We are quite familiar with the views of Prime Minister Netanyahu and the policy advisors within the Israeli government about sanctions and uh, what they view as uh, whether they should take place and when they should be put in place. We agree that sanctions have helped get us to the point we're at. We have a disagreement about uh, the way to achieve our shared goal, which is preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. I'm not going to confirm or speak further to conversations members of Congress may have had with intelligence officials, other than to convey they were about intelligence assessments. They're not about what their view is on policy. We know what the Israeli government's view is on well, sanctions. The official in question, or at least who has mm -hmm. released a statement about what he told mm -hmm. the congressional delegation, says that what he meant to say, or what, what, what his hand grenade reference to, was the fact <clears throat> was that his assessment was that if new sanctions were introduced, the Iranians might have might walk away, but that it would be temporary and that they would eventually come back to the table and that you, meaning the P5 plus one negotiators, and in particular the U.S., would be in a better position to negotiate with Iran than you are right now. It seems from the context that the secretary used this quote yesterday is that, that, that the administration is trying to suggest that there is daylight or a rift or some kind of a gap between what Prime Minister Netanyahu thinks and what the Mossad, what the Israeli intelligence, at least this one official, thinks. That does not appear to be the case. So I'm wondering if you can say whether the secretary was misled into thinking that that was, that was actually the situation. Well, I don't have an assessment for you on what was or wasn't discussed during the meeting with congressional officials. What I can convey is that there are many uh, around the world who have assessed, whether you want to call it a political assessment or what you want to call it, including a range of European leaders who put out an op-ed today in the Washington Post, mm -hmm. that if we move forward with sanctions, that could blow up the negotiations and could even uh, destroy the international sanctions regime as it exists. So whether or not that specific assessment was made during a private meeting, I don't have any confirmation of that. Right, but the problem with that is, is that the secretary himself raised it. He's the one who said it. he did it unprompted. And the context in which he presented it was to suggest that there is some, there is disagreement that Israel, the Israeli government and its ele elements of the Israeli government are not united about, about this and in fact think that new sanctions, some of them think that new sanctions are wrong. So that's why the question arises to you, and I realize we probably should mm -hmm. be asking him, but the second thing is, is that you said you point out this op-ed that the that the mm -hmm. Europeans wrote. But yesterday in the press conference with the external affairs or whatever her title is, EU now, high representative, uh, right? Mm -hmm. um, when after the secretary said that his opinion was that new sanctions would hurt rather than hinder, uh, would hurt rather than help the process and, and blow it up, she pointedly said, and I recognize that she's not in these negotiations, but she said she couldn't offer any prediction about what sanctions would do. So well, there I seems can assure to be a disagreement. Well, I those who are on her staff who are in the negotiations feel that it would have a detrimental impact, and that's what they're conveying. Okay. On, on mm -hmm. Go ahead, Suppose Said. there is that rogue element. Suppose that the Mossad has, has gone on its own, you know, in, in opposition to Netanyahu. Is that a good thing? Would that be like, a, would, would that augment the, the call for no more sanctions, you think? I, I certainly understand your desire to go down this road, but I'm not going to journey down it with okay. you. And let me ask you another question on the same topic. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that the Israeli prime minister is completely focused on his re-election and come what may? I mean, they go, they strike uh, in, in, in Syria, they do all kinds of things, basically to sabotage whatever chances 
for a, for a deal are. Do you, is that the feeling in this building? I just don't have an assessment of the Prime Minister of Israel's views on his do, election. Do you feel that the uh, Prime Minister of Israel is basically doing all he can to obfuscate any effort uh, in terms of reaching a deal? Well, I think, Saeed, we have a uh, we agree on the objective, which is to prevent Iran right. from acquiring a, a nuclear weapon. We disagree on the way to get there. There are many who agree with where we are, which is that putting new sanctions in place would be incredibly detrimental to the process and could even destroy the international sanctions regime. So, I'm sure when the prime minister uh, comes here and visits the United States, he'll talk about this and we'll continue to have a discussion and debate. Okay. By, by the way, when he comes here to the United States on, the, on February 11th, no, I'll be back. No. No. March, okay, all right, March 11th, March 3rd, March 3rd. okay, that's APAC, <laughs> yeah, right, anyway, let me go back to... <laughs> we'll just get a calendar out here yeah, on, exactly, on exactly. upcoming right. events. So the White House has said that <laughs> the President, the President Obama will not yes. be meeting with Pre Prime Minister Netanyahu when he comes. Will, will Secretary Kerry see him? Is there some prohibition against that kind of thing? Uh, he will not, and just election? for the benefit of everybody, let me just repeat the reasons why. I know some of you have seen the White House statement, um, but as a long, uh, as a matter of longstanding uh, practice and principle, uh, we typically, the President obviously does not see heads of state or candidates, uh, neither will the Secretary of State in close proximity to their election so as to avoid the appearance of influencing a democratic election in a foreign country. So uh, the White House announced the President will not be meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu and neither will Secretary Kerry when he's here. You know, this expression, does that, does that apply to lower level officials? Uh, I uh, think it's, I, I think that... Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, where I had, he is a... He's not a head of state, actually. He's a head of government. But okay, but, sorry. But when we were saying a general, I, I understand. A general, I understand. If it were others, I, as I well. understand. But when a head of state does mm -hmm. come here, there is some coordination, usually, sure. security-wise or whatever. You're right. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, are you saying that there will be no contact at all between? I'm not aware administration of plans for officials? other meetings, Matt. But I can certainly check. I, I don't think there will be. This relentless and emphatic expression uh, of basically distrust in the American position by the Israeli. Uh, Prime Minister saying, and despite repeated uh, announcement by the President uh, and by uh, the government that, you know, we, we have Israel's back, you know, we will continue, we will not, you know, throw it under the bus to use the term that they use and so on. But they are relentless, you know, he is relentless in saying no, 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 and so on. That, you know, despite you saying... Do you saying, have a question in there? You know, my, my question <laughs> is... Okay. Do you think that he's basically driving his own political agenda on this issue and not really the nature of the talks? I'm just not going to do political analysis on the Israeli election from here. Go ahead. Keystone, sorry to... Uh, so can you, we finish Israel, is that okay? Sure. And then we'll go back to Keystone. Any more? on Israel before yeah, we, regarding the Palestinians. I mean, Israel okay, let's do one more and then we'll go to Keystone. Go okay. ahead. Yeah, because I have some questions on the Palestinians. Okay, Israeli, uh, go Israel. ahead. You know, today the Israelis, uh, you know, authorized the building of 62, 66 housing in an illegal settlement, basically, you know, on uh, that is in the courts, you know. Uh, do you have any position on this or do you know well, anything our, about our, it? Well, our settlements on, our position on settlements are well known. I had not seen that report. I'm happy to follow up with our team on our specific view on that, if uh, okay. there's anything additional now, to that. Now, on the issue of aid to the Palestinians, we know that uh, in the in, in the bill that was passed, I think, mid-December and so on, calls for cut off of aid for the Palestinians. And we know that the budget, the 2015 budget, does not include a waiver clause in it for the president to basically do aid. So if they, if Congress decide to cut off the aid, what is the next step for you, knowing that the Palestinian situation is very precarious and very critical? I don't think that's exactly right, Saeed, okay, but well, why don't we get like you it. some more specifics on where things stand? Okay, and Houston? my last question, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, my last question is between now and, let's say, the election, mm -hmm. do you have any plans to meet with any Palestinian officials? We remain in touch, as you know, on the ground um, and uh, over the phone with Palestinian officials, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't have any meetings to plan read so, out for you. But. So if, at least for the time being, you are reconciled to the fact that they did file with the ICC. They may try again. At I the, wouldn't at say the... reconciled. Our view is well known. We've stated it many times on this position, but it doesn't mean we don't maintain contact. We do. Go ahead. Well, the Canadian ambassador, Gary Dewar, was up there um, supporting in a press conference mm -hmm. um, the bill to authorize Keystone XL. Mm -hmm. um, he said a couple of things which were perhaps a little bit... Um, uh, undiplomatic, I'm not sure, saying, um, you know, that um, he had heard the president's speech at the State of the Union, in which he talked about science. He says the science in the State Department report backs up um, 
the uh, giving approval to Keystone and, uh, you know, says it's our job to correct the facts and correct the myths that have been established around Keystone, basically making a plea for the Keystone. Um, do you have a reaction to that? Um, does the science and the State Department report back up having a, uh, a giving approval to the pipeline? Well, I think we're all familiar with the view of the Canadian government on this issue, and they've spoken about it quite frequently, and we have an ongoing dialogue with them about a range of issues. Uh, the fact is, and, and what we certainly convey uh, to any official in Canada, is that there's an ongoing process. Uh, as you know, uh, last week, but we were on the trip, so just to uh, update those of you who didn't see it, uh, the Department of State, uh, we notified the eight agencies identified in the executive order that they have until February 2nd to provide their views on the national interest with regard to the Keystone Pipeline permit application. Obviously, what will be taken into account is all of the information and the studies that have been uh, under that that aid, the agency and others have undergone over the past several months. And certainly responses by the eight federal agencies listed in the executive order are part of our internal process. So there's an internal process. There's lots of information that comes in and will continue to come in. And we'll look at all of that as we make an assessment. And have you given yourself a deadline beyond the February 2nd to um, determined to come up with the State Department's determination on no, this? No, there's not another deadline uh, that needs to be looked at and assessed. That's the next uh, step in the process. Thank you. Sure. Uh, go ahead. Ukraine? Yes. Do the actions of the Ukrainian government comply with the Minsk agreement? Are you referring to something specifically? Yes, or? using using heavy artillery shelling residential areas. And where are you referring to that happening? Uh, in areas uh, near near Donetsk, is it are, is it not happening? Or are you suggesting that well, it is not happening? I, I'm just asking because obviously uh, there was a, a terrible attack. As and I'm not sure if you're referencing this. There have been a few at a days bus stop in Donetsk. Uh, um, uh, no, no, that, that in, including this morning. Um, okay. Please go ahead. Um, and there's an investigation on that particular incident uh, that is ongoing by the OSCE. Um, and certainly we call on all sides to assist with the process. Uh, we understand that they have visited uh, the scene and will produce a report once it's concluded. It's fact of finding. Uh, and this incident certainly goes to the heart of why uh, we must see immediate implementation of the agreement made at yesterday's Normandy format meeting in Berlin, which included Russia, Ukraine, France, and Germany. Uh, I would say that uh, we've seen a preponderance of violations by the Russians and the Russian uh, backed separatists, whether that's the movement of uh, artillery or uh, military equipment, uh, or, uh, and I'd also remind everyone that the country is Ukraine. So Ukraine is defending their own territory. There are, are a larger number of political prisoners. So there are a number mean. of steps that Russia and the Russian backed separatists need to take, but we certainly expect both sides to abide by I didn't by mean it. just this incident. There have been a few days of okay. uh, uh, shellings. Do, do these actions comply with the Minsk agreement? Well, uh, without speaking generally, because I always think there's a danger in that if you're not talking about specific incidents. In general, Russia has illegally, uh, and Russian-backed separatists has Ill have illegally come into Ukraine, including Donetsk. Uh, Ukraine has a responsibility and absolutely the right to defend themselves. Now, we certainly expect both sides to abide by the Minsk agreements. We have not seen that happen. We've seen a lot of talk, not a lot of backup uh, from the Russian side. If there are specific incidents, I'm more than happy to talk um, about I'm them. I'm specifically asking about the actions of the Ukrainian government. Can you give a more definitive answer whether or not, not they You're not talking about a specific the Minsk incident. Agreement. I think I'll leave it at what I said. Well, wait, do we, wait, wait. With the <coughs> Minsk agreement, do they comply? Uh, you, you pass a judgment that Russia is not complying well, with the I agreement. I listed a Can range of specific uh, ways that Russia is not complying. Uh, and those are all public information. So if there's a specific incident where yes, Ukraine there is, is not, well, let's talk under, about Under it. the agreement, okay. sides must avoid uh, deploying and using heavy artillery. Isn't it what the Ukrainian government is doing right now? Well, first of all, um, let's start again with the fact that Russia is has illegally intervened in Ukraine and come into a country that was a sovereign country. So I'm, I'm not sure if you're proposing that a sovereign the country doesn't have the, the right government. to defend you're themselves. I think we're going to leave it at that. Russia. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you just specifically about the incident this morning with mm -hmm. the boss. Yes. 
what was yours when you said that it's under investigation? Yes. But can you not at least condemn whoever it was that uh, did of it? Of course, of course. Uh, we condemn the further violence in eastern Ukraine at a bus stop in Donetsk this morning, which claimed at least a dozen innocent lives. And, Absolutely. And that means that you would condemn it if it ha if it was uh, the the government that did it, right? The Kiev government. Of course. The, the and you would condemn lives. it if if it was the separatists. Yes. Who did it. Can you say? But but at the same time, you're saying that. The government of of Ukraine has the, I think you said, the right and the responsibility and the right to defend itself. Do you see actions like that, uh, like like the shelling of, or this shelling of the bus, as being within the that being within that purview? Well, I'm not going to speculate on that, Matt. We don't have information on the specifics here. Obviously, when it's the death of innocent civilians, that's something we would mm -hmm. condemn in Ukraine or anywhere around the world. Uh, the point I was making was a larger point about whether or not Ukraine should be able to use military equipment in their own country. Well, okay, understandable. That I, I understand that. But the problem is that you <clears throat> seem to be, you're condemning the separatists for doing things um, that, Presumably, you also don't have full investigation into. Well, there are a range of incidents. We certainly have right. seen exactly what's happened. So, broadly speaking, when, the preponderance of violations are on the Russian okay. and Russian-backed separatist and side, which way may be the case. But I, I can't say that. I don't. I don't know mm -hmm. that. Um, but this, it, it just seems to be that when the government of of Ukraine is accused of. Uh, shelling of bombarding uh, civilian targets when they are the ac that accusation is made you refrain from um, you, you don't take you, you say let's ha let's have an investigation into it and and when there are incidents that you ascribe to the separatists there's an immediate condemnation. I, so I think I that's where the, that's these exactly questions are coming. What's happened? There are times where it's clear who is responsible. This is a case where there's going to be an investigation. Right. There are also violations like the failure to release certain prisoners, right. the fact that they are moving military equipment across the border, things that are violations that don't involve but attacks. This bus incident happened in a place that's controlled by the separatists. It is probably unlikely that the separatists would bomb themselves is well, that not we'll, correct we'll let the investigation well i understand that but it would but but it would seem just if you were like looking at it from the outside that this was not a self-inflicted wound that it was done in the course of what you say is the right and responsibility of the government of ukraine to defend itself um is that not correct? Well, I understand why you're putting together different details to come to that point, but we're going to see the investigation well, through. Right, I, I, it's pretty obvious, though, isn't it? No? We'll let the all investigation right. see itself through. <clears throat> Go ahead. On uh, Pakistan, uh, mm -hmm. the reports about uh, two organizations, Jamaat ud daba and Haqqani Network, being banned uh, by Pakistan. Have they informed you? Or have they really been banned? Can you say this one more time? Jamaat ud dawa and Haqqani Network, the two terrorist organizations, have they been banned by Pakistan? Uh, have they informed you about it? Well, <laughs> we've certainly seen the reports, and there have been a range yeah. of reports. Um, the Pakistani government uh, has made clear in both private conversations and public statements that it's in Pakistan's own interest to take steps against all militant groups in Pakistan and explicitly to not dif differentiate between such group. We support this commitment and believe that it's fundamental to addressing uh, terrorism and ensuring attacks such as the horrific one that happened just weeks ago uh, the Pesh that impacted the Peshawar school children never occur again. Uh, we recognize that Pakistan is working through the process of implementing measures to thwart violent extremism, uh, including the National Ac Action Plan. We don't have any confirmation of specific steps. But at the same time, they are having a, a huge march uh, later this week. Um, how do you see that? They, on the one hand, they have banned the organization. On the other hand, the leaders are roaming around in public. I don't have. Do you have more details on the march and the purpose of it? I don't. I, I don't can have send details you the on details, that. Uh, okay. Okay. Great. Uh, have, more on Pakistan or India? Okay. Sure. Go ahead. Um, the Ukrainian government is using heavy artillery in residential areas. Is it not? Isn't it a violation of the Minsk agreement? Well, one, as I'm sure you're aware, there was an agreement for Russia to pull back their heavy artillery yesterday as part of the agreement made in Berlin. I would go back to the same point I made without getting but, into speaking to generalizations. Ukraine is a sovereign country. It's, it's a specific the, question. Finish, it's not a generalization. Let me finish my answer, please. Thank you. 
uh, they have the right to defend themselves. If you're talking about specific incidents, then I'm happy to speak to them, but I'm not going to answer your questions on broad generalizations. Go ahead. Syria. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I got two more on Syria. One is that uh, these uh, two Japanese uh, mm -hmm. uh, hostage, uh, as far as I know, deadline is tomorrow. Uh, do, do you have any update? Do, do you talk to Turkish government uh, uh, on this specific uh, I, issue? I don't have updates on conversations with the Turkish government. Obviously, as you know, we have a range of conversations with the Turkish government about Syria and other issues. I talked a little bit a few days ago about the Secretary's conversations with Foreign Minister Kashida uh, and others about how horrific uh, this is, the video, the threats. I unfortunately don't have any updates on the status. Oh, on this, okay. The second one is uh, uh, about the trade and equip program. Mm -hmm. Uh, last time, I believe we were told that this program should kick off uh, in March. Mm -hmm. We are almost end of January. Do you, do you still think this timetable is going to work? I would point you to my colleague, Admiral Kirby, over at the uh, Pentagon spoke to this extensively last okay. week in terms of the it. timing and the specifics. And okay. I think that might help you in terms of where things stand. Okay. On Japan, sure. Yeah, do you, um, have any advice for them about regarding the ransom that they're, they're expected to pay? Well, I think you're all familiar with what the view of the United States is on ransom payments, that it puts uh, citizens at risk, uh, and it certainly is not a policy that uh, we here in the United States implement or we support. Um, so that certainly is uh, something I think Japan knows our longstanding position on that issue. Mm -hmm. How confident are you that Japan will abide by the U.S. position on ransoms? And if it doesn't, how will this affect U.S.-Japan relations? Well, I think, one, I'm not going to get ahead of the process here. Obviously, our view is known. Uh, the reasons for our view is known. Um, I don't have any assessment of Japan's uh, plans. Do you know, though, if you would have had contact with the Japanese to tell them of your position? or to suggest to them that it might not be a wise idea to pay a ransom? We have conveyed privately our position, and they're familiar, certainly publicly, of course, as with our position and, as well. and, and your position is, is that uh, in this specific case, that if Japan paid a ransom, it would put other Japanese citizens at risk? Well, and, and, and all citizens, uh, yes. Right, but you're... For kidnapping and uh, only sustains the terrorist organizations. Sure. So if there's any, is there any specific coordination or support that the U.S. has provided to Japan or is willing to provide? I'm, I'm just not going to get into specific details about our private diplomatic conversations. As you know, the Secretary spoke with Foreign Minister Kishida just two days ago, I believe. And certainly we're prepared to provide any support we can. Uh, go ahead. Um, Cutter? Uh -huh. Sure. Um, an admitted al-Qaeda operate operative in the United States, um, Ali al-Mari, was released last week from federal prison and then transferred to Qatar. What was the State Department's involvement in his transfer? I just don't have any details or specifics I can confirm on that. Um, I think it's more of a question for DOJ and others, um, but I can certainly follow up and see if there's more we can offer. Go ahead. Yeah, that is called the Million March uh, to be held in Karachi on Sunday, and mm -hmm. it's called been given by Hafiz Saeed of, of Jamaat ud -Dawa. This is a protest against the publication of uh, cartoons uh, in the latest edition by Charlie Hebdo Show. Uh, I'm happy to talk to our team about it. Did you have a specific question about it, what our view is? or No, if there is a ban on the organization, how come they are having the public value of a millions march? Well, I am not. I don't know enough about the march to know if there's a specific connection there. And but. coming to India about, say, after Secretary's trip uh, where he met the Prime mm -hmm. Minister, and now president is traveling. Did secretary get a chance to brief uh, the president uh, on his India trip? Well, the secretary um, has certainly been over the White House for a range of meetings over the last couple of days. Um, I know, obviously, they plan to discuss his meetings uh, while he was in India. And the secretary's had lunch with, uh, I believe, just a few days ago with uh, National Security Advisor Susan Rice. So he's certainly seen the president quite a bit about a range of topics. But he certainly has passed on his meetings and his assessment of what happened there. Go ahead in the back. Uh, I, just, I wanted to bring it back to Yemen for okay. uh, one second. Apparently, there are some reports of secession, the possibility of secession in southern Yemen. Is Would the U.S. support that as part of its support for a political, peaceful political transition? Or would you have specific comments on that? Well, I know there were a range of proposals, I think this is what you're referring to, that were um, kind of being worked through in the, in the political agreement. Um, 
between the Houthis and the and the Hadi government. Uh, I don't have any particular assessment of particular components we support or don't support. In general, we support de-escalation. We support a peaceful transition. I can see if there's anything we have particular concern with. Well, actually, I think it's the the security it's directorate in Aden, mm -hmm. the, the port, has, is expected to make an, a, a, an important announcement. Okay. Later. Well, I'm not sure that this is part of the deal between. Okay. Separate, separate issue I, then. Okay. I, I, well, if, if she's referring to the same thing. Okay. Or is that what you're referring to? Okay. We'll look into that. Go ahead. Just a clarification on Iran uh, deadlines. Mm -hmm. In uh, his testimony uh, at the Committee on Foreign Relations, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Blinken mentioned that uh, for a political agreement, uh, we're looking for a conclusion by the end of March. Mm -hmm. but. Senator Menendez was talking about March 24th for some reason. Is March 24th a specific deadline as well, or is it March 31st? March 31st. Um, it's approximately four months past the timing of the last meeting. Um, so we know there's been confusion, and we wanted to be a little bit more clear about how we're looking at the timelines. So March 24th was just Menendez's personal question? I think it was just adding four months, but March 31st is the timeline. Thank you. Go ahead. Question on Cuba. Sure. You know, you began by talking about Cuba. Today, apparently, the, the talks began on the issue of diplomatic exchange and yes. so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if this happens, what is it like uh, the timeline? I mean, when is it likely uh, that uh, a Cuban embassy will be open in mm -hmm. Washington and vice versa and people begin to travel? Well, I don't have an exact timeline for you. It's something that we'll continue working on over the coming weeks. And the secretary spoke a little bit yesterday to some of the specifics that would need to be worked through, including lift, lifting travel restrictions on diplomats, lifting caps on the number of diplomatic personnel, unimpeded shipments for our mission, free access to our mission by Cubans. Uh, those are all issues that are being discussed on the ground. And Assistant Secretary Jacobson is doing a press avail uh, as we speak, perhaps, to talk about these issues. Now, we didn't expect that this would all be worked through or determined. It's just a beginning of the discussion. And clearly, we hope that the speed at which these issues are resolved will escalate now that we're engaging in dialogue. Oh, just ahead. back to Cutter, um, are you saying the State Department had no involvement in this transfer? I just don't have any more okay. uh, to offer for you. Um, okay, go ahead in the back. Um, I have just one more, which is sure. completely different from everything else, okay. which is um, I believe the Turkish government has invited uh, leaders to the 1915 Battle of Gallipoli uh, Remembrance Ceremony. Mm -hmm. Does Secretary plan uh, Kerry plan to attend? If not, is the U.S. sending anybody else? Sure. Uh, well, I believe uh, that is in April, if I'm correct, about April, the April timing 24th. of it, yeah. which, believe it or not, is about a century away in uh, travel. Um, so I don't have anything to announce approximately. It's a figure of speech. Oh, Matt, is, oh, Matt is rolling his eyes at me up here. Um, <laughs> you mean it'll be in 2115? You're, you're so exact. Um, it's quite some time away in how we do travel plans. So I have no travel plans to announce for the secretary or any other official here. Go ahead. An eon, perhaps. An eon. I Not think that's century. longer than a century, but go ahead. Whatever. Uh, I got two really brief ones. Okay. First is on uh, Bahrain. Yes. I don't know if Marie last week spoke to this at all or if you have been asked this before, but I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on the conviction of Nabil Rajib, um, the sentence that he was given, and the travel ban that was imposed upon him. I believe we have – well, maybe not. Let me repeat – Okay. Uh, some points here, and I apologize if this is repetitive. Um, we're disappointed by the sentence. It is our understanding that Mr. Rajib may appeal the case. As we have consistently say around the world, as we consistently say around the world, the United States does not agree with the prosecution of individuals for crimes of peaceful political expression. Uh, as we said last October, we urge the government of Bahrain to drop the charges against him. Okay, and, and release him, presumably. Presumably, yes. All right. Uh, and then the second one is on Egypt. Uh, mm -hmm. First is a logistical one, okay. and I don't even know if this is possible because I don't know if President El Sisi is going to be in Davos when the president, when the secretary gets there or not. I'm not do you sure know if they're if, overlapping. But. Well, okay. Do you know if there are any plans for him on his current trip to see any Egyptian officials, whether it's the president or not? Uh, I'd have to check. Uh, not that I'd seen on the last schedule, but I'm All happy right. to check uh, where he, the bilats sit right now. Yesterday, this is a little convoluted. Okay. Yesterday, in his meeting with the Australian Foreign Minister, mm -hmm. 
do you know if the secretary raised the case of the Al Jazeera journalist, the Australian Al Jazeera journalist who's being held in Egypt? Did that come up at all? Do you know? uh, I don't believe that was a part of the discussion they had. They had a few minutes one on one, but not in the meeting that I was in. Obviously, I would just reiterate, it was not a very long meeting because it was between uh, the meeting with EU High Representative Mogherini and he had to get uh, to a meeting right. at the White House, so it was a bit condensed. Okay. But it, it, it is safe to assume, though, that your position on the, the, the jailing and the prosecution of these journalists in Egypt is something that Absolutely, you, that and it's something we've to. talked about in the past, and we certainly talk about it at a range of levels. That you're opposed to it, that you the, think that they should be released. The Al Jazeera right? journalists? Yes. Yeah. I have a very quick question, oh, okay. uh, Iran-related. Yesterday, the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei uh, sent a letter or addressed a letter to Western youth, telling mm -hmm. them not you know, to prejudge Islam. Is that uh, is he within his right to do so? Did he preach any protocol by doing that, or uh, what is your reaction? To his uh, have, I, have you I, read we, it? Maybe you can comment on this later. Okay. We've certainly uh, seen that letter. Uh, I don't have a comment on it, including any breaches of protocol uh, or otherwise. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.